Okay, chapter 10 is from Amber's perspective. The bus ride to Jackson Hole takes 50 years. At least that's what it feels like. The real number is more like 13 hours, which is bad enough. When you grow up in a town that can be crossed on an eight foot in eight minutes, 500 plus miles has no meaning to you. We decide that it's too risky to sit together. The police are searching for a group of four, so traveling as solo kids seems the safest. At first, I'm almost looking forward to some alone time to organize my thoughts, maybe even make a mental to-do list. But then I realize there's nothing to put on it. Ballet practice? Yeah, right. Homework? Mm, I'm not even in school. My goal weight? I haven't stepped on a scale since leaving Serenity. The things I worked so hard to keep under tight control before just aren't in my life anymore. And the weirdest part, I don't even care. Compared to what we're facing out here, like finding Tamara Dunlevy and learning the truth about ourselves, worrying about grades or ballet or a diet just seems dumb. It's like mourning my long blonde hair that I've been growing for the past 13 years. It needed to be gone. Too bad. We did what we had to do. End of story. My mother called it my crowning glory. Consider me uncrowned. Very womanly, says Malik official, says Malik's official opinion on the new me delivered at the station in Denver. It's revenge for my crack about the princess backpack, which is currently riding in the baggage compartment under the bus, even though it could easily fit into the overhead rack. Seems to me it's more manly not to get all bent out of shape over a little pink knapsack, I told him as he placed it in there among the giant suitcases and trunks. There's plenty of room for you down there, too, was his reply. Come to think of it, maybe I have one thing to put on my imaginary to-do list. Things to do today, one item only. Punch Malik in the face. Sorry. But that's not an option until we get to Jackson Hole. Okay, fine. It's not really an option, period. Okay, please get me off this bus. My seatmate conked out on my shoulder 10 minutes out of Denver and is pressing me up against the window. It's actu I'm actually questioning whether I'm cloned from a real criminal. A true mastermind would have figured out a way to toss her out of the speeding bus 100 miles ago. I shouldn't complain. Tori is true as behind me, and she's much worse off. The man next to her can't seem to believe that anybody sent a 12-year-old alone on a 13-hour bus ride. She had to come up with this elaborate lie about how her parents are divorced, and she's on her way to visit her dad. The problem is she was so convincing that now the guy is peppering her with questions. This keeps up. She's going to have to invent an entire life story. Maybe when this nightmare is over, she can write a book. We were writing a book together in Serenity, a picture book for young children. Tori was going to be the illustrator. Funny that never occurred to us that there hardly were any young children in our town. The only kids that mattered were the Osiris lab rats. We're all in middle school. I try to pass the hours by going over what little we know about Tamara Dunlevy. Now, 63 years old, she's one of the richest women in the world. She started out as a daring and brilliant computer hacker, but later founded VistaNet, the company that made her a billionaire. She's currently retired, living on a ranch somewhere outside Jackson Hole. Somewhere outside might be the operative words here. I gaze at the endless miles passing by the window. We don't even know if we're going to be able to find her or what kind of reception we'll get if we track her down. But we do know that she walked out in Project Osiris, which could mean that she objected to the idea of creating human beings just for the purpose of experiment. Maybe, just maybe, she'll be on our side. According to Tori, the scenery around Jackson Hole is supposed to be some of the most beautiful in the country. We have to take everybody's word for that. It gets dark before we get a chance to see anything. We pull into the bus station after midnight and wander the main strip, taking in our surroundings. At least we're allowed to be four kids again. There's no way the Denver police follow us up here. The town Jackson is nice. It's the first place we've seen that's as neat and clean up to date in shiny modern and serenity. Can't even find a crack in the sidewalk or a single piece of litter. In school, my mother told us that our town was completely unique in that way. Line number 10,000 or maybe more. One difference, though. Jackson seems to be all stores and restaurants, and most of the shops either sell ski equipment, fancy candles, or t-shirts. People here must be real dopes, Malik concludes. They can't remember where they live unless it says Jackson Hole on their clothes and coffee mugs. That's not it, Eli puts in. People come here on vacation to go skiing. These shirts and things are souvenirs. Vacation? Souvenirs? These things are alien ideas to us. I have to say I'm not impressed. Life has big challenges and deciding between the Jackson Hole steak knives and ski Wyoming Alpine bobbleheads shouldn't be one of them. We're not going to find Tamara down Levy now, Tori points out with the honest the middle of the night. Oh, we need a place to crash so we can go after her in the morning. How are we going to do that? Challenge some leak. I don't think any of these stores went to Hawaii. Any of these stores went to Hawaii like the Campanellas. We walk a little further. After hours of sitting on the bus, it feels good to stretch our legs. The high-class shops 
an eatery than not a little, giving us a little less fancy kind of places that we saw in Denver. Convenience stores, burger joints, and something called a pawn shop with a variety of unrelated objects in the window. You can't tell what kind of store it really is. I'm pretty sure they're not selling pawns like in chess. The farther we go from the center of the strip, the less serenity like it gets. Till we, at last, we come to a neon sign that reads, Moat. Which is really motel, but the L is burned out. Underneath it says, reasonable rates. Which sounds like us, since we're running low in cash. It actually says reasonable rats, but that's only because the E fell off and it's lying on the grass. I don't want any rats, even reasonable ones, grumbles Malik. Thought your problem was bugs. I needle him. Malik scowls. For a guy who makes a lot of jokes, he has no sense of humor. Troy comes up with a plan. I take our money and head into the small office. The clerk, who doesn't seem that much older than me, has been sleeping, no doubt about it. A room for one night, please. He blinks at me, trying to wake up. How old are you? Fifteen, I say. Bumming my age by two years. Credit to Tori for choosing me for this mission, since I'm the oldest girl. My mom gave me the money to pay. She's just parked the car. We've been on the road all day. For a minute, he looks like he's going to wait until I produce mom. I feel like he can hear my heart racing. If we can't convince one semi-conscious teenager that there's nothing fishy about us, we might as well go back to serenity right now. In the end, the idea of going back to sleep is stronger than the curiosity about me. He comes up with a form to fill out and slides the key across the counter. I give him $90, which doesn't seem like a very reasonable rat, but I'm hardly an expert at the price of things in the outside world. Thanks, I say, and head out to sneak myself and friends into room 12. The moat is kind of cheesy, but as we walk to our unit, we pass a glassed-in room designated guest services. Inside, we can see a coin-operated washer and dryer, an ironing board, a battered treadmill, and a computer and printer on a folding card table marked Business Center. Internet. Eli's eyes light up. You guys, go to the room. I'll see if I can find an address for Tamara Dunleavy. Room 12 is smallish and not in the greatest shape, but this is our second night in a row with actual beds, a working TV, and a real bathroom. Luxury. We watch the news broadcast and discover that our outside world has more important things to worry about than the missing crazy girl in Denver and her three friends who broke her out of custody. I let out a sigh of relief. It was my screw-up that got us wanted by the Denver police in the first place. It would be awful to be caught, but even worse if it's my fault. I was so sure talking that cop would solve all of our problems. For all my list and organization, I was the one who did the stupid impulsive thing that almost sank us. So this is her list now. Things to do today and every day. One thing it says, look before you leap. But we have seemed to look out. Nobody's searching for us anymore except the purples, and they have no way of knowing where we are. I hope. Malik is almost insulted that the manhunt is over. The cops are such idiots. They've got four criminal masterminds on the loose, and they don't even know it. Tori stares at him. You're kidding, right? This makes our lives... A million times easier. Can you imagine trying to find Tamara Dunleavy if we didn't dare show our faces in public? We're not criminal masterminds, I had pointedly. We just got our DNA from them. Malik shrugs, stealing cars, running from cops, busting into a house. If you ask me, we're putting together a pretty good rap sheet. Tori glances at her watch. What's keeping Eli? You don't think the desk clerk caught him? That guy? I guarantee he's dead to the world. You know Frieden and computers, Malik adds. He's probably all nerded out, surfing the, and downloading and reprogramming, having the time of his life. When Eli finally returns up half an hour later, though his expression is grim, I can't find Tamara Dunleavy. But everything we read says she lives around here, I protest. I'm sure she does, Eli agrees. But there's nothing more than that. No address, no phone number, not even a hint, like north of town or near a certain mountain or river. It turns out you can be unlisted where your information says private. Be pointless in serenity where everybody knows everybody else, but here rich people try to protect their privacy. Malik shakes his head in disgust. That makes no sense. What's the point of being rich if you can't show it off? I hope you never get rich, I tell him. Tori looks thoughtful. Just because she's unlisted doesn't mean she's invisible. The local people must know about her, where she lives and places she goes. We'll have to ask around. There's a new desk clerk at the motel when we leave that morning. When I hand in the key, I say, we're leaving. My mom's just loading the car. The clerk is an older woman, but she doesn't seem any more interested in the clientele than the sleepy teenager who took my money last night. She gives me an absent. Have a nice day. Mom wanted me to ask you, I forge on. She's heard that Tamara Dunleavy has a ranch around here somewhere. Is that true? The woman looks blank. Tamara who? Dunleavy? You know, the internet billionaire? Never heard of her. 
We have a very economical breakfast of toast and cereal at a diner. Why does everything we eat have to be unhealthy just because we're fugitives? Can't all laws like vegetables? Eli tries the waitress. Does Samaria Dunleavy ever come in here? It would be cool to meet somebody so rich and famous. The waitress thinks it over. Samaria Dunleavy. Didn't she play Penny on The Big Bang Theory? Um, no. She founded a company called Vista Nut. She's a billionaire. We get a lot of celebrities here, the waitress replies, but mostly during ski season. Zach Efron, Zach Efron came in with his new girlfriend once, and he was so nice. And Lady Gaga broke her ankle snowboarding last year, but that was at one of the resorts. My brother is an EMT, and he got a great selfie with her in an ambulance. We exchange bewildered glances along the counter. Zach Efron, Lady Gaga, who are they, and what do they have to do with the scientific theory about the origin of the universe? What is she talking about? We can't ask because I think we're supposed to know. The outside world is different from Serenity, but this is really different. <clears throat> Eli takes a paper out of his pocket and carefully unfolds it. It's a photograph of Tamara Don Levy that he's printed from her Wikipedia page. This is what she looks like. The waitress's painted eyebrows go up. You know what? I think I have seen her. She turns and holds the picture out to the short order cook. Carl, do you recognize this lady? The counterman glances over. Oh, yeah, sure, everybody knows her. She comes in here, I ask. Nah, not here. Strictly high class, this one. Money at the wazoo. A real do-getter. Upper to her neck in every charity. Always saving something. The wells, the children, the rainforest. Whatever is popular that week. Who wants to know? My grandmother grew up with her, Tori replies. Any idea where she lives? Grandma asked me to drop by and say hi. The man gestures helplessly with his spatula. Who knows? Pick a mountain, pick a mansion. Those fancy types love the nosebleeds. As we leave the luncheonette, I slide up to the others. What's a wazoo? Must be some kind of bank account, Malik guesses. <laughs> so, we <go> to <laughs> so we go to the bank, repeating all that stuff about Tori's grandmother to the manager. I think she's one of your wazoo clients, <laughs> Tori adds helpfully. <laughs> I'm sorry, but we're not permitted to give out information on our depositors. He looks like he's having a hard time keeping a straight face. Okay, so maybe Wazoo isn't a bank account. By the time I learn everything I need to know about the outside world, by the, about the world outside Serenity, I'll be a very old clone. <laughs> we try the post office and several more stores without much success. A few of the people we talk to recognize the picture, especially the ones in the more expensive stores. We pick up a smattering of information, but nothing really helpful. She rides around in a steel gray chauffeur driven Bentley. She's like a good tipper, although not as good as the Hollywood types, no matter how dressed up she is. She always wears sneakers. Great, grumbles Malik, dropping himself to a bench on the mang drag. A rich lady in sneakers. That's really narrowing it down. I feel kind of helpless, a helpless frustration that we're floundering like fish out of water. There should be a more systematic way of going about this. In Serenity, I was busier than the other kids, and I got everything accomplished by being organized. Jackson may be bigger than our hometown, but it's not a huge city like Denver. I can't. It can't be that hard to find a famous billionaire in a chauffeur-driven car. And then I'm staring at it. The largest building on the strip in the Jackson Convention Center. The sign that stands at the curb reads, Welcome, Teton, Teton, Teton County Char Charitable Society. Look, I exclaim, pointing. Big deal, snorts Malik. We're here to find Tamara Dunleavy, not paint the orphanage. Malik, you can be so dumb sometimes. Don't you remember what the cook said? She's a do-gooder. If this is a meeting of the local charity, she must be a part of it somehow. I bet she's in that con convention center right now. It's worth a try, Eli decides. The worst we can be is wrong. As we approach the three-story building, four sets of eyes see us at the same time. A steel gray Bentley sedan in the parking lot. The Wyoming places, Wyoming license plate reads Vista. The company she founded is called VistaNet, Eli whispers. Behind the tinted glass, a chauffeur sits at the wheel reading a book. The pieces are clicking into place. A charitable society, a chauffeur driven Bentley, VistaNet. I feel better, more in control. We're thinking. Not just grasping at straws, we step into the ultra-modern chrome and glass lobby. A floor-to-ceiling board lists the day's event, the charitable society's meeting in the ballroom, which is right on the main level. We get there to the sound of applause from within. A moment later, the doors open and people begin to emerge, chatting among themselves as they head for the exit. Eli takes up the picture of Tamara Dunleavy, and we all compare the pa passing faces with the photograph from Wikipedia. No matches. 
The stream of attendees slows to a trickle. We sh exchange agonized glances. Could we have been mistaken about this? After the car and the chauffeur and everything? <clears throat> Mustering my courage, I peer in the open door. There are still a few stragglers gathered around the podium. My heart sinks. No internet billionaire. Finally, a large woman in an enormous orange muumuu steps out of the way, and I see her. The hair is white, swept back from a face that seems surprisingly youthful, with piercing eyes that are a brilliant shade of blue. She wears a charcoal gray business suit, and on her feet, bright white sneakers, fresh out of the box. The only indication that this person is enormously wealthy is her earrings, which feature diamond studs the size of dimes. Nice zombies, Malik whispers. <laughs> To Merritt John Levy. Do you remember earlier when they were at the, at the boarding school and the girls were um, lis listening with the stethoscope and they heard them talking about zombies and they thought that the zombies were earrings or jewelry. So he saw her big diamond earrings and said, nice zombies. <laughs> All right, that's the end of chapter 10.